Good morning, let's get started. The class looks pretty lean today. Um, we are supposed to get the early admits, so if they ever come, yeah, this is my name. But So, we can continue with where we left off in last lecture, right? Oh, and, and I have the uh, all the homework assignment projects and quizzes and stuff in my office, so if you can drop by sometime to pick it up, that'll be good, right? Um, so are there any questions so far in what we what we've seen, especially in the synchronization stuff? Let me let me go over it again because I want you to understand fully what's happening because this can be confusing. Um, like the the impression I got from students where this either is like too complicated, we like to just get rid of it, and it, and you can't really do that because this is a problem you're going to have to face. Um, and they don't quite understand who puts the critical section, what does this mean, how to lock, and stuff like that. Because in the example, it looks easy, but in real life cases, when you look at real programs, it's not, it may not be as trivial, right? Um, so they, you need to have three conditions for critical section that the system or somebody will provide, right? The first notion is the notion of uh, ex <coughs> exclusion, which means that you may have, so if you define this critical section somehow, and you tell the operating system, and we'll see what those primitives are in a little bit, which is usually like a lock and unlock kind of primitives. Once you do those, all it guarantees is within that section, uh, begin to end section, there can only be one thread running into inside a section. There can be any number of threads after, any number of threads before, but only one thread can be exclusively inside the critical section. And that's the definition of critical section. That's what the system will provide for you. In addition, it provides, so it, this cannot happen, right? If, if a critical section solution costs it to do this, where two things are allowed into, into inside critical section, then you are violating the, the notion of critical section, how to react to that, right? So this can never happen in any of the solution we'll come up with. And the, I think I may have flipped it in the last class and I was explaining this. But essentially, the next two goals are there to make sure that you make progress. It's a useful procedure to work, right? What you don't want is, you necessarily don't want that all the threads which are, like for example, the two threads coming up there, you don't necessarily want to define the order in which they get in, right? Because you don't want to say first in, first out or some other scheduling policy. And it'll, it'll become clear to you why as we move along. The reason is if you have multiple processors and you have a kernel which can schedule multiple processors, each one of them may be making an independent decision. You don't want to, what is called, serialize the whole thing. You don't want to say, I need an order where thread one, if it came first to the critical section, it has to go, thread two has to go kind of stuff, right? And, and we'll see the notion of what it is, you know, serializable kind of stuff. But essentially, if you, the more constraints you place, the system gets slower. So you want the things to go as fast as possible. So you're not going to guarantee that any particular order of threads will, will make it, but you're going to guarantee that the, the weight will be sort of bounded. Even though it's not bounded in terms of time, it just says that you won't wait forever. You'll, you'll get your turn, but no guarantees on when that will happen, right? And there's no order implied. So you cannot say, I wrote a program where I expect thread one to run, then thread two to run, then thread three to run. You cannot expect that from the critical section. You, you can do it through your code, but not through the critical section, right? So one of the things that you make, you, you say is, any decision on who should go should be done by the piece of people who are waiting for the threads, not by the people who are not involved, right? So if a thread is running and it's not involved in this whole, it doesn't care about the critical section, that's not involved. One of the threads which are waiting decide among themselves who should go. And that may or may not be the one that you expect, but one of them will go, right? And only one of them will be inside, and only one of them who is waiting will decide who should go, right? And the last one is, when you have those, let's say, three threads waiting, right? It's a bounded wait, right? And we don't specify the bounds in time or anything. We just say that if the three threads come here, it may happen that thread one got lucky, right? So thread one keeps getting into the critical section over and over again. But overall, all threads get a chance to go, right? Even though we don't say exactly what order, how long you will wait, right? But you will you will get through, right? So if you have a solution which cannot guarantee that, that it's not possible. So if it if it means that thread three will never get to run, that's not something you want, right? So these are weak guarantees but they are good enough for you to use and build systems based on that, right? And one thing I want you to remember is, 
the notion of critical section, it's entirely up to you as a programmer. The operating system does not really tell you how you should, what you should put in a critical section or not, right? So here is an example. Okay. Here's an example of a little code segment, right? Where let's say i, j, and buffer are shared, right, between two processes, right? So you have this little test, you know, test if i not equals j, and you have a test i, I not equals j, and then you operate on buffer, right? And this operates on i, this operates on j, right? Would you need to put a critical section around this? Even though they're operating on the shared variable, they're operating on the shared variable <coughs> called buffer, would you have to protect this? This is a critical section for your code. At that, you said yes, right? I just figured since they're both writing the buffer. Yes. I like because of the conditional. I mean, one of those could affect the other just because of the i is not equal to j statement. Yeah. So. Yeah, it could be, but yeah, since I checked the i in i equals j, you can imagine that they are writing to different components of buffer, so they don't really um, collaborate. I mean, they don't really collide, right? Um, it's a little bit more deeper than this. If you really think through, right, there could be a third thread which is modifying i or j, right? So you could fail after the if i not equals j, right, at this point, a third thread can come and make i equals j, right? So the if was correct, but it's not atomic, right? So after the if, before the buffer, things could have changed, right? But let's assume that that's not the case. And in, the, in this sense, you can look at the code. If you understand the code, you can say, I do this check, and I don't modify i or j in a third thread, which means that there is no possible way that they can both write into the same uh, buffer element. So they're not actually working on the same data. They're working on something which is part of buffer but different components. So I don't need to call it a critical section, right? And you do that because critical section, adding these primitives slows down your process because it basically makes it run only one thread, right? Only one thread can go to a critical section. So if you have multiple processors, essentially only one thread gets, gets through that segment of code. So you don't want to randomly put um, Critical section. I mean, uh, critical section throughout the process. If you if you put too many critical sections, then your process will slow down. So you want to understand what is going on, and maybe you can decide that in this case it's safe, right? And that's important to know because you're always trying to balance whether you should be conservative or whether you should be uh, living on the edge, right? The reason why I call it living on the edge is. You may write this program, leave it there, right? You may graduate, I mean, let's say you go to a company and you're working on a project which is, spans for years and years. A few years down the road, somebody comes around and they look at this code and they go like, why, why are you checking i naught equals j, right? Because it doesn't look like j is being modified here at all. So they can remove this line of this check because it doesn't look like that makes any difference, right? So unless they understood the whole program, what's going on, all the threads, threads and glory, right? They can look at this and go like, I, I think this, this particular se se code, code segment is redundant, so they can get rid of that, right? If they did, then in the case when i happens to be equal to j, you will run into problems. You'll run into problems where the, the stuff is overwritten in, in weird ways. You can also run into um, deadlocks, which you'll see a uh, little bit down the road. And so essentially, you'll get into this problem where the program used to work fine, somebody removed a piece of code which looks innocuous, and then you get a deadlock, right? You get your program kind of freeze up because something kind of happened, right? You may not have faced it so far. I don't know how, how, how big a code, piece of code you've written in your life, right? But that's, that's traditionally what happens with these large projects. After, after a while, no one quite understands what's going on. And you have these things where things look innocuous. You remove something, and you get race conditions or whatever, right? The, the, the debugging race condition, debugging these kind of cases is, is very hard because it depends on how these threads get scheduled, right? So you may run this program <coughs> 10 times. 
it may fail all 10 times, or it may just fail one in 10 times, right? So <coughs> debugging these things are very hard, and, and but, but, the, but the key to remember is it's nothing to do with the operating system. From an operating system perspective, from what you learned from this class, you'll say, hmm, that's not our problem, right? It, it's you, you change the code, you modify the code, you wrote a buggy code, and it'll get to give you nothing to help you. All it's giving you is that notion that if you define something to be a critical section, then you'll have the guarantees that we talked about, right? So is, that, is that clear? How many of you programmed with, with threads in a significant fashion? One, two. So did you guys use like C or Java? C. C, okay. What did you, what did you write? I was working on some video code for Okay. How about you? Um, I actually use the QT library. Okay. Yeah, so all of you will have a chance to uh, write the code for the homework project, right? So for the homework project, if you look at the piece of code, I mean, the actual program, it's not doing anything, I don't think it's useful for anybody, right? But it, it has a weird kind of interaction that you, you have to be aware of. You know, if you how many if you looked at the project, you should look at the project as soon as possible, right? Because you need to understand what the program is doing, right? Don't try to understand it from a perspective of what what is this useful for, but in the sense of what how it's writing into that uh, into those arrays, because you need to understand that to figure out which ones to put in a critical section, right? You have to use critical section to protect those that particular piece of code, right? Uh, the simple solution is to put the whole thing into critical section, in which case you'll get the flat performance for any number of, I mean, as you add more processors, you continue to see the same performance, right? So the finer you can get, you can get better performance. You can get as close to, so if you go for one processor, it, it goes at, let's say, 1x. If you have two, it'll go half, you know, it'll take half the time, three, a third of the time, and fourth, a quarter of the time. You may not get that close, but it'll be fairly close, right? To get there, you need to lock these things. To do that, you need to understand what the program is doing, right? So next, what we're going to look at is some of the ways you can solve this critical section problem, right? I'm going to tell you what the primitives are uh, later in this lecture, hopefully. But the idea here is how would you solve this problem? So you need to have some primitives where you as a programmer would, would add a piece of uh, code, right? And that would ensure that all the three conditions that we mentioned before, exclusion all, uh, and, and the boundary weight and all those things, will be solved. And only one thread can be inside if you use the right, right code, right? So the, the, the first solution is the, let me go back to the, it's a, it's a Peterson solution. It's a classic solution. You cannot implement this on real machines because of the property that it expects things to be atomic, right? How many of you heard the word atomic before? You probably heard it in database or? You, yeah, you, you probably heard it in database. And one of the things you'll notice is some of the things we do here, you would have heard it in databases, right? Because they, they have the same sort of flavor, locking and transactions and all those things are people talk about it in databases and uh, people talk about it here too, right? Databases and so they also have a notion of things have to be um, all the critical section thing we talked about. The difference there is the guarantees that the database gives is a lot stricter than what the operating system can give you. Mostly because the operating system is a general purpose thing. So it doesn't want to be giving some very strong guarantees like a database system can give you, right? So the concepts are similar. So one of the notion of atomic transaction means that if you execute that particular piece of code, you either get all or nothing. You don't get half of it, right? So for example, if you, um, uh, we'll see the code in the next, next slide. This one ex expects that the load and store to happen atomically, right? And as we saw in the last lecture, the count plus plus was not really atomic because it could be translated to three different, uh, three different instructions. Each one of them can be interleaved with the other one, right? So you can either have the count plus plus go through, count minus minus go through, one after the other, or one of the three components of count plus plus interleave one of the three components of count minus minus, and that's not good. And with that, you cannot implement um, critical section. But suppose you had a notion of a atomic load and store, where store happens either all or nothing. It does not interleave with anything else. 
this is one way of uh, solving the problem, right? The, the, the way you solve that is you have a Boolean array called flag, and you have an uh, integer called turn. And anything you write uh, into these variables, anything you read from here is atomic. It's not possible for it to leave, right? So that, that has to happen. And in normal programs, you cannot do that. So if you implement this in a normal program, you will not get critical section code. But it's an easy way to understand how, how this algorithm would work. So that's the, the piece of code which will implement the critical section code. Essentially, the, it, the thing to remember is all these instructions are atomic, right? So you, you don't worry about how you implement in real systems. The way you do that is you, um, the, you have a critical section here, and you have a reminder section here. The, the flag variable can the flag can either be so let's say there are two right so i and j so flag can either be true or false for each thread right so so you have a flag as big as the number of threads and turn is the variable which figures out who should go right so you only get into the critical section so when you start out you set flag of i your thread i so if you say flag of i to true which means that you want to get into the critical section so flag Ex explains that you want to get into the critical section. So if you say flag of i equals true, that means you want to get into the critical section, right? And then you say turn equals j. So turn is the other one. So you're not. So you you are saying I want to get into the critical section, but I want to give the turn to the next person, right? Not to myself, right? And we'll see why that is necessary. Because if you keep the turn to yourself then potentially you could keep running and never give the, the threat to anybody else, which will violate the bounded weight criteria, right? So here I say, thread the, uh, I give the uh, threat to somebody else, and I wait in that loop, right? I say while flag of j and turn equals j, meaning I wait till another thread wants to get in, and it's, it's turn to get in, right? So as long as the turn of somebody else and they want to get in, I will have to wait in that while loop, right? I'm, I'm, I'm spinning, I'm in a busy loop, because I'm, I continuously look for this variable. And here is where the atomicity comes in. So you have to make sure that both those variables are atomic. You can't have interleaved stuff, right? So, so for the other thread, right? Which, so if those two conditions are, are, are making it go into spin lock, that means another thread is inside the, the critical section, right? Thread J is inside the critical section. Because for, for thread J, the flag would have been flag of i would would be true, but the turn would be itself, right? So it, it would have gotten in. So the thread J, when it finishes, would set the flag of J to be flag of J to be false, right? For the thread J. So when the th thread J sets flag to be false, thread i's flag of J would become false. So you'll follow the out of the loop so you can get in, right? So essentially, the, the condition to say somebody can get in is set by somebody who's inside the critical section, but the decision on who can get in is done by the people who are outside, right? So the one who's going in the while loop looks at the flag J, and when it sees that flag J was true, it can go in, right? And it, it, it follows all the three models because only one thing can be inside. It's not possible for you to have more than one inside especially because you assume that the loads and stores are atomic, right? And, and only the people who, you know, only the people in the before section can do this stuff. And since you do this turn equals J, you allow others to run, right? So you are kind of, you are never saying you are the only one who has to run, right? So I give the turn to somebody else and they have to give the turn back to me. So that way, it's bound, it, the, you, you are guaranteed that everybody will get some some turn, right? Some some time to run, right? It's not going to be precisely divided among the different threads, but you give somebody else a chance, right? So this is a simple example of how you may implement this, and it depends on the hardware support. So you would have to put this if you were if you had a notion of atomic loads and store. If you can do that with the C program, then you will have to write this piece of code into your program, right? So your program will. Now have this little piece of code up there, flag and turn and all those things, which are not part of your program, which are not part of your logic, but something that you use to get critical section uh, functionality, right? But turns out you can't really do that without hardware support or 
having this kind of a notions. So we'll have to look at, uh, so yeah, you have to involve the operating system, right? So you either have to get hardware support or another way to implement that in a single processor machine is to disable interrupts, right? If you disable interrupts when you're going into a critical section, which means that nobody, no interrupts will happen, including clock interrupt, right? Which means that if you're on a single processor and you're running on a thread, the only way you can give up your CPU is if, you, if the clock interrupt comes in and the operating system takes control away from you, if and it preempts you, or when you give up it yourself, when you're you going into I.O. or something, right? Since in this case, you don't assume that you're going to do a, a input output while you're getting the critical section, if I can disable the interrupts before I start the thread, and if you have a single processor, then you will get the uh, critical section functionality because essentially you would, nobody else can interrupt you while you're making this decision. So you're, you're getting atomic transaction because it's not possible to interrupt anybody, right? So that's one thing that operating systems have done in a, in a single processor machine, disable all interrupts, right? It's used extensively within the kernel. So if you look at a single, uh, single processor kernel, the way they lock stuff is they disable interrupts, do whatever they have to do, if they have to modify kernel structures or whatever, and then enable interrupts, right? It's not preferable in a single processor machine because that basically says the whole thing kind of stops and lets you finish it, right? It's, it's okay if you finish the job quicker, but if you tend to drag on and on within your critical section, then this is a horrible idea because you're essentially saying nobody else can do anything on the system till you finish your code, right? But at least it's, it's easy to uh, assume that this is okay, and this is what most of the single processor machines did, right? So if you, if you look at Windows XP or so, before they had the multiprocessor versions, um, Windows X, not Windows X, maybe Windows 95 or something, right? Windows 8, 95 was not designed to run a multiprocessor machine. So one of the ways they implement this is they disable interrupts all the time, right? You don't get the performance as much as you want, but it's, it's an easy way to get away with the problem. It's not, so you can do the same thing for multiprocessors too. If you have many, many processors, you can disable interrupts on all the kernels, but it gets more tricky, right? Because if I have to do kernel critical section, I'm, I'm a third on one processor, I have to send a message to all the other, other processors to say, now stop what you're doing and disable all the interrupts, right? And then all the processes have stopped. So I need to get a notification back saying, yes, I've, I've, I've stopped the processes or what, you know, none of them are in critical section. So once I get the feedback saying all of them have stopped, my thread can proceed. Once it's done, it has to tell everything else to say, now you can go, right? Disabling interrupts on one processor is easy because the operating system can decide to disable interrupts and be done with it. If you have multiple processors, then you have to disable interrupts in all of them. I have to know that all processors have stopped before I can proceed. So you don't do that in a, in a multiprocess system. If you have a multiprocess system, you want better solutions than to shut down the whole machine and have only one process go through, right? So we'll see some, uh, some uh, different uh, mechanisms on how we can achieve these goals even when you have when you don't want to stop this machine and, and the, the, some of those, right? Um, the way we do that is we have the notion, we have specific uh, instructions which are atomic, right? So your hardware, like if you x86 or, or PowerPC or what, what have you, have these special instructions which give you atomic transactions, right? You don't use it for your whole program because those, those instructions are typically slow. If you're, if you're looking at, uh, uh, from the hardware perspective, essentially you'll flush all the all the buffers and caches and everything before they they can execute that. Right. So it's not designed to replace your regular load and store, but these are are additional functions that the hardware has to provide. So once the hardware provides that, operating system can use that to provide some other critical section functionality to you, and and that's what we'll see. Right. So two of the functions that um, commonly provided are test and set. So this instruction will do a test and set. We'll see what, the, what it exactly does in the next few slides. But these are atomic instructions provided by the hardware. This is instruction from the assembly language uh, level. So even though you'll see a piece of code which gives the functionality of what you want, it's an atomic instruction, meaning all of them happen at once and not at all. You don't get half of it done, whatever it is done by the hardware, right? So the other notion is a swap. It'll swap 
two variables that you give. So the values of two variables are, are swapped. Does that make sense so far? Right. So the, the first one is a test and set. So that's the code segment which implements test and set. Right. But you have to understand that this is a atomic instruction provided by the hardware. So even though it looks like there are three different instructions, right, the hardware will guarantee that it will all happen at once or not. Essentially, when you call test and set, right, it will, so if you, give, you have to give the address of a memory location, right, so when the instruction happens, it will set whatever value that you gave on the memory location into that variable, and whatever was in the variable will be returned to you in the argument you gave, right. So if you call set test and set with a boolean of target, whatever value pointed to by target um, is returned, and the target value is set to, so if you give an address for target, so whatever value was in target is returned to you, and target will now have true, right? So you set the value of whatever is pointed to by target to be true, and whatever original value was, was in the return value, which is returned to you, right? So it essentially kind of swaps, right? So when you, when you give an address, it says whatever is in the address value, you will get it back, and it will now be true, right? So the way, way you uh, use that is, let's say you have a variable called log. All these is things, uh, the way you use them is, is to throw a memory variable. Let's say you have a variable called log, right? And let's say you have a variable which is uh, log, which is initialized to false, right? So when you start the program, it's initialized to fall, false. And it's the same kind of sex, uh, code we saw before. You have a critical section, and you have a and, you know, entry section, and it's a reminder section, right? In the entry section, you do this test and set of address of log, right? And you do a while loop here, right? So what happens is, initially, lock is false, meaning that no one is inside the lock. And you come to this address, right? So when you set this test and lock, right? This one come in? So when you set this test and lock, right? What would, what would happen to the value of lock? Lock used to be false, right? Yes. Set to true. Yes, yeah, so lock variable is set to true, but you will it will return to you false, right? So in that case, you'll fall through, right? So you get to run, right? So in one transaction, you are able to get in, but lock is set to true, right? So the another thread which is waiting would do the same thing, right? So its return value will be true, but it'll set the, the lock variable to be true. Right. So it'll keep rotating, it'll keep spinning here till this process sets the lock to be false. And once you set the lock to be false, one thread can get in. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I, I think you should go through the, uh, how these things work because it, the, the, the code, code segment can be a little tricky, right? But think of this as, as two different threads. You have one thread and another thread, and lock happens to be false. When you do this, when you do this switch, test and set, right? Test and set always sets the value of lock to be true, but it'll return whatever value was there before. So, if somebody was to have gotten out of the lock and had it false, then somebody can uh, fall through, right? And this will only work if this test and lock is atomic transaction. It cannot work on a if you write it as a C program, because the C program cannot guarantee that this is atomic, right? Because it, the swap has to happen atomically. You cannot have where the value of written value is read, but before you can write it, somebody else writes it, right? Does that make sense? So this is one primitive way, one way of you writing, being able to write, write this code. Um, the next notion is using a swap, right? So conceptually, this is what swap will do. So if you give it two variables, you'll swap the contents, right, atomically. So whatever was pointed to by A will now be part of whatever is pointed to by B, all atomically. You cannot interrupt halfway through, right? And the implementation of how you would do that, how would how you would use swap instruction to achieve um, the critical section code is, is over here. But if you, if you look at it, it's essentially the same as what you did before, right? You, you kind of call key to be true, and you swap you swap that here, right? 
which is the same as what you did in the test and set. Within the test and set, it was setting the block to be true all the time, and here you are giving it as an argument, right? So even though the code looks different, it's the same. Instead of giving the, the true value to be inside the test and set, here you are set, giving it as argument, and you are swapping it to, to make the value to be true, right? So it's, it's exa exactly the same code. I'm, I'm going to let you think through the stuff, but it's the exact same code as before. Um, we have to do this because the particular machine may only support swap operation, right? But you're essentially implementing test and set uh, with swap by having this key to be true all the time, right? So both these instruction, both these instruction sequence depends on the particular architecture. If the hardware does not provide either of those, you cannot use any of these solutions. But different architecture provides different different of these primitives, and you have to use this to uh, get the, the primitives you want, right? So traditionally, these are not available to your C compiler. So if you when you when you when you look at the kernel, one of the places where you will use the direct uh, assembly language code would be for these, right? For, for these kind of test and set, you will have to hand code it to say, give you the lock and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Because it's not a very widely used instruction, the test and set are, are swap, but they, they give you the, the, the guarantee that those are atomically uh, implemented, right? So here's an example of test and, uh, test and set with the bounded weight, right? So here you, you um, you give it bounded weight for more than one one thread, right? Here you have a, 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 a um, so essentially what you do is if you look, I'm, I'm not going to go through the exact sequence of uh, instructions here, but essentially what you do here is different, right? Here what you do is when you are when you're done, you don't give it to the um, to so you give it to the next thread on the uh, so if you think of them as a circular queue, right? So when you are done, you give the, the lock, you give the weighting to the next person on the queue. So you, you, you go through the, this array to figure out who else is waiting for the thread. So it's a circular list here. So if you have thread i, right, you look for i plus 1, i, I plus 2, and so on and so forth till the end of the buffer. Then you rotate around and look for the next one. And whichever is waiting, you, you give it control. right? I will, I will let you look through the code at leisure, but essentially that's what you're trying to do. So when, when you're finished with the lock, you don't just say anybody can go right now. You basically look through the code and say, who's somebody who's like numerically next to me in a, in a, in a circular linked list fashion would get to run. If nobody else, such, no such person existed, right, meaning that no such thread existed, then you set lock to be false, right? So when you say j equals i, in which case you kind of looked around, right? So you did i, you did i plus 1, i plus 2, and so on and so forth, and then rotated around to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And you came to a point of i, meaning u, which means that there is nobody else who's waiting for locks, in which case you can set lock to be false. But if somebody else is waiting, you set the waiting for them to be true, so the lock will never get um, freed, right? So you're basically saying, when I'm done, if anybody who's uh, numerically next to me is waiting, I directly get them to go, right? Lock will still be false, nobody else can get in. And when they're finished, they'll numerically see who's next to them will go, right? And you keep going, and then you can kind of rotate around as a uh, circular link list. And eventually, if you find that nobody else is waiting, then you set lock to be false, right? Again, you'll have to work through these things, assuming that there are multiple threads. And this is a solution where it, the, the, the little difference you make is you kind of give the order of who should run, right? And you can argue whether it, it should go numerically this way or numerically that way. That's not important, right? The, like who should run is not important. It's just that you are ensuring that if you finish and somebody else is waiting in the lock, you're not letting anybody else new inside. You're just going to give somebody else in the somebody else a chance to run. So hopefully it'll be bounded, right? So if you run this algorithm, if every thread is waiting, then essentially you'll go through this list and everybody will get a chance, right? And again, you're not, it's important to remember that you're not talking about time. You're not talking about how much time you're going to wait in seconds, milliseconds, or what have you. Each thread can stay inside the critical section for all they want. You're just saying that at some point they'll get the, the, um, the time they want, the, 
they get to go inside, right? And, and, and those are important concepts, and we'll, we'll see throughout the, this lecture. We're not worried about the time. We're worried, only worried about you being able to get in or not, right? Time in, in terms of seconds, and if you want a guarantee that you want to get in in, in two seconds or something, this is not a data section for you, right? And even though I'm not going to go through real-time systems in this course, and like I said before, real-time systems is a separate course, right? Real-time systems worry about being able to have predictable performance, being able to say, I can get something at a certain time, right? So one of the examples was the nuclear power plant uh, example. So if you know that to shut down a nuclear power plant takes you 100 millisecond, and when, a, when you get some sort of a trigger saying shut down the plant, right? you have to shut it down by 100 millisecond, let's say, right? So in that kind of a system, this kind of a thread would not work for you, right? But because here all we are saying is, if you are waiting for a critical section, you will eventually get it, right? It could be one millisecond, it could be a second, it could be an hour, but you'll get it, right? So when you're talking about real-time systems, this is not a data section you want, because you, you want to have predictable performance. You cannot have this, you will get it sometime, right? Because you want things to happen at, at a particular instant. So when you, when you look at real-time systems, they won't like this kind of, uh, you know, squishy time guarantees. But general purpose operating system, this is fine, right? Does that make sense? So I'm going to introduce certain classical problems. These are, these are things you will see uh, uh, referred, referred a lot in, in textbooks and uh, so on and so forth. These are examples of, of critical section problems which have unique properties which are considered important. It's used throughout the operating system or when you're writing programs. These are class of applications which are easy to explain and you see that over and over in different contexts, right? And there are some of them are buffer, bounded buffer, reader writer problem, uh, dining philosopher, and sleeping barber problem, right? So the, the bounded buffer problem we already saw before, right? Essentially, you have a buffer, right, which can hold a certain number of uh, elements. The goal here is there's a producer and there's a consumer. The producer and consumer are independent things. They're independent threads or what have you, right? So they try to pick stuff off of, the, off of this buffer. If the producer goes faster, you let it go as fast as how many elements are on the buffer, right? So the producer cannot go too fast. It cannot keep producing too much because there's not enough place to store it. If it tries to go too fast, it will have to wait. Right? So you have to have mechanism to say, you can only put, let's say, 100 elements. If you produce more than 100, the producer has to stop. Right? And the consumer takes stuff off the, off the queue. If it turns out that the consumer is going too fast and there's nothing to do, it will have to wait. Right? So this is an example of something where Producer and consumer are free to go at different speeds, but you want to bound how much they're, uh, they're able to diverge, right? And one example of that would be like a web server. If you get too many requests, then you want to, you want to be able to get all the requests and serve them at the time you want. You don't want to have infinite size because resources are, are, are finite, right? And so it happens in your printer queues and, and, and so on and so forth, right? You want the print jobs to be coming into the system a lot, but if you're getting like a millions of print jobs, your printer cannot keep up with that. So it has a bound of how many print jobs you can wait. If you give more than that, it asks you to wait, right? The next one is a reader-writer problem. So here you have shared some data structure, right? You have a bunch of people who only read, and you have some who want to write, right? They're operating on the same data item, right? So let's say you have a value called count. There are a number of people who want to read, and some who want to write. It's okay for a number of people to read the content because it's not being modified, but it's only you can only allow one person to write, and when they are writing, you cannot have many people reading. Right? So if you're writing a counter, right? Um, let, let's say it's, it's a counter of, of of anything you can imagine, right? Like let, let's say it's the um, what's a counter? How many how how many um, hmm, like elections, right? How many how many votes does some candidate have, right? You can have any number of people read the content, right? But whoever there which comes to write the stuff, when they write it, they cannot have half results. They cannot have case where the, let's say, election results or something. You cannot have results. So the results can either be whatever was before or whatever is the new results. You cannot have something in the half, right? So if the, if the vote count went from 1,000 to 2,000, 
right? You want the system to either return 1,000 or 2,000, but not something in the middle, right? So the way they implement that is they, they assume that any number of readers can read the stuff, whatever is stored there, but a writer, only one, one person can be writing because you don't want multiple people writing or what have you. So the way you implement these locks are there are reader locks and writer locks. Any number of reader locks are allowed. Only one writer lock is can be pending. So you have different policies. One, one policy may be if you have if you keep getting lots of reader reader requests, keep serving all the readers till there are no more readers, at which case you do the writer lock. And when you're doing the writer lock, nobody else can read. All the read requests will be pending while you are writing. And once you finish writing, then people get to go, right? So in, in this case, readers get more privilege because they keep, so if they keep coming, writer get, gets no chance to write, right? So the other way is if you have writer waiting, then you finish all the readers who are waiting, who are already doing some things, and after they're finished, you give the writer a ch chance, right? So these are different ways of how you would implement the stuff, but essentially the idea here is you're trying to solve this problem of systems where there are few writers and there are lots of readers. They're not to be treated the same because if you talk about the critical section, we said only one thread can be inside the critical section. In this case, main, any number of readers can be inside because they, they're only doing reading. So it's okay to violate the policy that only one thread can be inside the critical section just because you know there are they're all readers, right? But you ensure that the only one writer can be inside the thread. Any number of readers can be inside, right? So you'll see this in, in a whole bunch of stuff. You, you might have seen this in your own experience when you're trying web services and all those things. But this is the problem of reader-writer locks. And we'll see how, how you would implement these with, with the uh, primitives that um, we'll, we'll introduce next. Right? Then the next classical problem is the dining philosopher problem. Right? Depending on who teaches it, um, there, there's little variants of this stuff. But essentially, you have five uh, philosophers, right? And these philosophers eat and think, right? So they, they eat and think. And the, for, for eating, so there's, there's, there are five bowls inside, right? And there are five these things inside, right? So depending on who is teaching it, it could be rice bowls and chopsticks, it could be spaghetti and fork, uh, what have you. But regardless of what, the only way that a philosopher can eat is if they have both these things both chopsticks, both forks, or whatever. So they cannot eat if they don't get both the, both the stuff. And as you see, there, there are, there's one between each one of them, right? So if all of, it's not possible for all of them to eat, because if this one gets these two, and that one gets those two, and that's it, right? So only two can be eating at the same time. The challenge is, how do you, how do, you do that, right? So if you want, so, you're not the philosophers are not allowed to beat each other up to steal the, the forks, right? So if the fork is up there, you can take it. If it's not on the table, you wait, right? So these are these. So these philosophers, all they do is eat and sleep. So they they sleep, they think for a while when they don't need the fork, and then they start to eat. When they start to eat, they have to wait to get both the forks, and they can eat for a little bit, and then they keep it back, right? It's a beautiful problem which it, because it explains a lot of the principles that we will we'll talk about. Um, and don't worry whether it's eating rice or spaghetti or what have you, right? The starvation here is it's a very uh, easy problem to see, right? If a philosopher never gets to eat, you, you assume that they, they're going to starve and die, right? So you want the philosophers to think for a while but eat for a while. So how do you do that, right? And we'll spend a little bit more time on this one because it's a very classical problem. Because it'll it expose the, the way it's set up, it'll expose um, what's called a deadlock, right? Which means that we can reach a point where nobody can proceed, nobody can feed themselves, they all start to death, right? To give you a hint, if we just let it go like that, right? It's possible that, that each philosopher gets their left fork, right? Let's say they, did the, they get the fork on the left, right? So what would happen? Are they waiting for the right fork? Yes? They would always only ever have one, so none of them could ever eat. Yeah, so they'll, they'll that, that's called deadlock situation. They'll starve, right? Because they, they cannot do that. They cannot hold their left, left um, fork and wait for the right one, right? It, it might work out sometimes, but it, it can reach a condition where all of them have their left fork, none of them have the right fork, 
and unless they're willing to beat each other up, you can't proceed, right? So this will, this will explain some of the concepts we are looking at. So this is a very classical problem, and it's a very important problem. And you'll, you'll see that when you're writing code. So you're never going to write uh, a program which, which feeds philosophers or, or, or these people, but you'll see this when you're writing programs which share data structures, right? And we see there are conditions which are, which are violated here, which causes deadlocks, right? And you, would, you might have seen deadlocks in, in your programs, right? You might have seen that your program may work for a while, and then it goes into a state where you cannot do anything but kill the application, right? How many of you noticed your PowerPoint or Word or something to go into the state where it's working fine, and then it just goes into the state where you can't do anything, right? It just, machine is fine, everything else is fine, but this PowerPoint or Word or whatever you can think of, like Internet Explorer or something, will go into the state, right? And I'm not sure what exactly happens in each and every case, but traditionally when you go into a deadlock, that's what happens. In the case of the philosophers, when they don't have one of the folk, they're all waiting, they're all waiting for the other folk to come. So it looks like it's not doing anything, it's just that they cannot resolve it themselves, right? So you would have seen the, the, uh, the, what happens when you get into deadlock uh, in, in real life, so it's an important problem to worry about, right? So the last, last case is the is a sleeping barber problem which is a variant of the uh, um, producer-consumer problem, right? So the, the difference is here, if the buffer is full, the producer goes away, right? The way it's phrased is the sleeping barber issue is, you know, you have a barber who cuts hair, and he has a certain <coughs> number of chairs. Let's say there are four chairs here, right? So if you as a producer come in here, if a chair is empty, you get to sit, and then the barber will eventually come and, and cut your hair, right? And once you're done, you move, and then somebody else can sit in your chair. But if all the chairs are full, and a new customer comes in, they walk away, right? In the producer-consumer problem, that does not happen. The producer-consumer problem, if, if all the chairs are full, and you come in, you wait, right? You, you form a queue, whereas here, if the, all the chairs are full, you don't get your haircut, you go away and come back, right? So that's a variant, and, and, and that has implications on how these <coughs> things work, right? So again, all these things are easy for you to understand how, what the real challenge is, but the, the, you will see this in real life, not as a, when you're programming a, a, a philosopher on how to eat them, but when you write your code for doing something. So you may notice the same concepts coming up when you're solving a your homework project too. You may see that you are, you are implementing some of these features, right? I'm going to uh, give a hint of what we're going to look at in the next lecture and, and stuff from there. Essentially, what we're going to now look at is the actual primitives. Uh, one of them is called semaphore, right? Which we will use to implement the, the critical section problem. The reason is most programmers do not want to worry about critical section, much less worry about the test and set and all those lower level primitives. You like some kind of a system call or some function which is sort of easy to work, worry about, than the, the, the low-level details that we, we looked at, you know, the test and set and swap and all those instructions, right? So one of the uh, such mechanisms is called uh, semaphore. A semaphore is a, a variable, you have two operations on it. One is a weight and one is a signal, right? The definitions are here. Again, these are atomic instructions given by our operating system, where weight means that if you give a variable with a certain number of, uh, a certain value, weight will decrement that value till it goes to zero, in which case it'll wait, right? It won't let you go through. And signal will increment this counter, right? So when you call signal, whatever the counter was, it'll go up. When you call weight, whatever the value was, it'll keep going down till it goes to zero. And when it goes to zero, it'll, it'll wait, right? It won't let you go, right? And there's a slightly different, um, Variations where S can be unrestricted, or S can be uh, Boolean, in which case S can be uh, zero or one, in which case it's a it's a binary sum of four or a lock, right? Essentially, you can use this to only let one person in, and we, we'll see how that happens. And everything in the next lecture, we'll, we'll repeat this and then go from there on how you use that, right? So, are there any questions about what we covered so far? I, I, I strongly encourage you to go through the, the, the code segments to see how, how it works because you need to kind of look through what happens when you have multiple threads uh, because it, it, you need to understand this before we actually go through this, this module, right? I'll see you guys on Monday. <laughs>